This land is your land, and this land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. This Land, Rediscovering Colorado's National Parks. They are a beautiful contradiction. Natural, because we've decided they should be. Wild, because we fenced and gated them. Untouched, only because our fingerprints are all over them. Pristine places crisscrossed with roads and trails, signs and parking lots, all so that we might come along and imagine America without Americans. Our national park system, a beautiful contradiction, celebrating its centennial year. This land, made for you and me. Thanks for joining us, I'm Kyle Clark. One of Colorado's four national parks has the element of surprise. For every 20 people who visit Rocky Mountain National Park, only one person goes to Black Canyon of the Gunnison. It makes it the perfect place to begin rediscovering our parks. If the Grand Canyon is the sunny, awe-inspiring symbol of the American West, then the Black Canyon of the Gunnison is its alter ego. Dark, brooding, a monument to nature's danger, its power, and the fact that water shapes our state. I mean, you can see pictures of the canyon and think, oh, that's really a beautiful canyon. But until you walk to the edge, you, you know, you can't be prepared for this place. When that view makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, just know each hair is one year's worth of work for the mighty river below. 2,000 foot canyon formed over about 2 million years. Time will tell. That's a human hair a year. And this is a long story. Brilliant. Unbelievable. <laughs> I've, never seen, I've never seen a canyon anything, anything like, it. like this. A hair's width of erosion each year, a hair deeper, a hair darker. That's how Black Canyon was born. It's kind of hard to believe, you know, it's a, it's a really small river down there, you know. It's <laughs> this is the tamed Gunnison, dammed and diverted by man for man, turned into a trickle of its former self. Even still, most of the time going through the canyon would have been impossible. Rangers like Nick Myers will warn. Rafting is impossible. Most of the rapids are unnavigable. We get a few kayakers a year that give it a go when the water levels are right, but the, the currents and the undertow is just, is just really um, amazing. So this is as close as most will ever get to the depths of Black Canyon. And people for thousands of years have been analyzing risk here. There's no evidence at all of humans at the bottom of the canyon before around 1900. You know, so people were here before then for sure. There's lots of evidence on the rim, but they were looking down in the canyon thinking, no way. <laughs> no way for most. We asked, which way? It's not a maintained trail. Uh, we don't have any signage, we don't have any markers. Some folks might not know well, what they're really getting into right away as far as the wilderness route goes. A busy summer day at Black Canyon is about 2,000 visitors up at the rim. 15 of them can get a wilderness permit to take this trail down to the river bottom. It's hard to get to, but it's worth it for a reason. It's gorgeous and there's not 10,000 million people trying to get the same shot as you or trying to get the same spot in the shade or the same spot on the river. Yeah, I mean, we were the only ones down here. The ranger said that we were the first people down for the day. It seems like they do a pretty good job of scaring people away at the ranger stations. They do. It's a difficult hike, a slippery descent and a grueling ascent to get out. But in between is as close to paradise as you will find in a national park. It's empty, it's remote, and it's, there's a lot of solitude here. This is just, I think, my favorite spot in Colorado. It's almost like being at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but with far less people. And you really do have it all to yourself. At Black Canyon, solitude can be purchased with far less of a tax on the legs. 
back up along the rim, relatively few visitors means you don't have to go into the wilderness to be alone in the wild. That's a really rare opportunity at a national park. You come to a spectacular park, a national park, and have a, a lot of uh, quiet. <laughs> it's quieter still when the snow falls. Wow, and Black Canyon in the winter, it takes it to another level. I'm impressed. It's the contrast between the dark rock and the white snow. It's a real vacation. And not only for the body, also for the brains and for the head and everything. So it's really worth to make the long way from Germany. Talking to folks at any of Colorado's four national parks has a subtle way of shaming you for not visiting more often, knowing how far people come to see our backyard. I've driven by the, uh, <laughs> the entrance, you know, probably 10 times and just I'm always going from A to B and never thought to stop in. Daniel Roman and, and Becca made Scalero made their first visit when few people do in wintertime. This is beautiful. It's, it's stunning. I didn't know what to expect. There's no going into the canyon in the winter. I couldn't imagine a better time to be here. Most snowshoe or cross-country ski around the rim. Yeah, this is a huge off-day bonus. <laughs> These two, they'll camp. Yeah, they shoveled out a site for us. <laughs> There's one site shoveled, the rest have about four to six feet of snow in them. You know, it'll, it'll be a kind of a test for us. I've never camped out in the winter time before, so just to uh, see if we've got the right equipment and if it's any fun. <laughs> the right attitude and the right amount of peppermint schnapps, yeah. <laughs> Suppose time will tell, as it always has around here. So even with that power of the Gunnison River, it still takes a really long time to eat away this rock. And it's incredibly humbling. Like, it, it would, it, we could never do this. Like, man could never do this. It doesn't feel as cold as it looked when reading the weather report. <laughs> yeah, yeah, incredible. <laughs> we don't have that, that in France. <laughs> no. There we go. Nice job. <laughs> Decided to come out and, and see what it was all about. Have a new experience on the weekend. and It's been amazing so far. Yay, fire. when this land continues. Oh, let's say you see a pottery shard. You could pick it up, look at it, and photograph it, but, but please put it back right where you find it. Uh, that's part of the story. Preserving and protecting Colorado's most fragile national park, Mesa Verde. Cliff Palace is so well known that over time, you know, in a hundred and some years of this being a park, it's been damaged and, uh, um, and it needs help. As the park's popular sites struggle with closures and repairs, we'll head for the lesser known side of Mesa Verde. But I think out here at Weather Mesa, if you want to experience a place that's quiet, this is it. A place to consider the ancient tribe that lived here, then left. And, and some people want to make all these esoteric meanings behind it, where I'm like, human beings are human beings. And, and oh, I remember we did a, an addition on our house, you know, and as soon as the floor was poured, the first thing my kids want to do is, you know, push their hand in the concrete. A park's human side, when this land, rediscovering Colorado's national parks, continues. inspiration to rediscover our national parks came from looking at some old photos and realizing that we have spent decades driving to the same overlooks, taking the same pictures, just with better cameras. Grandma and Grandpa Clark toured the parks in 1977, Mesa Verde, Rocky Mountain. 30 years later, I took basically the same photos in the same spots. As we go in search of new adventures and familiar places, keep an eye out for your vacation photos throughout the hour. Some new ones and some classics. My grandparents drove into Mesa Verde in the 1970s and they turned left 
Nine out of ten cars do. They're all headed for Cliff Palace and Spruce Tree House, the most popular cliff dwellings. Those are the kivas, the little circles. Rediscovering Mesa Verde is as simple as not turning left, going right instead. This is not like your normal national park. Mesa Verde is locked up like a home, because it is. Several, in fact. It's well worth coming out to this point, this site called Longhouse. And this was actually designed out here and excavated out here to help draw visitation pressure away from Cliff Palace. Yet 40 years later, most visitors to Mesa Verde don't come to the Wetherill Mesa side of the park. They never see the cliff dwelling that's nearly as large and even more accessible than the famous Cliff Palace. And it's very quiet over here. And you earn it a little bit. You have to walk a little bit more. You can't just drive up and park and walk, uh, you know, 50, 60 feet and see something. And you have to come with a ranger. Two distinct styles. But this is uh, something that's more utilitarian. See how it's blackened? A ranger like David Franks. Mesa Verde isn't like a park where you can just go out and hike freely and, and because there is a sensitivity of, of the archaeological sites. And some of that stuff you may not even see because you're busy looking around. So you can see right here we have this little barrier. And the big reason is right here is all original floor. And those are corn cob imprints. They plastered the floor and those are corn cob imprints that was done seven, eight hundred years ago right in this area. Isn't that amazing? But you can see how fragile that would be. You walk on that and crack that up. Franks is what the Park Service calls an interpretive ranger. Fancy way of saying he makes this ancient home understandable, real. My interpretation is that's my son or my daughter, and they're bored. And uh, they just push something into the floor, and it looked cool, and they did it again. And then they did it again. Then their mom and dad said, hey, don't do that. <laughs> he sees this place through the eyes of a parent and through the eyes of a child. I remember this is one of the parks that as a child that inspired me to be a ranger. And at one point, I just sat down and watched the birds dart about, and I just listened, and it was quiet. And uh, I remember, I, I, all the way back then, I, I, I wanted to be a ranger here at Mesa Verde National Park. And, uh, um, but you had that moment just of quiet where you can let your mind Imagine what it's like living here. Imagine the people here. What sounds would you hear? What smells would you, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, it grabs you then, you know, it definitely grabs you. It asks you to imagine the ancestral Puebloan people living in this area for 700 years, before the white man, before the horse, before whatever caused them to pick up and leave all the physical things they had built. You, you connect people with common things. So we always, we, sometimes we start talking about survival items, food, shelter, water, fire, that kind of thing. But now let's go beyond that and talk about thriving. And thriving means you're expressing yourself through art, through music, and you're leaving marks. You're, you're building pottery, you're trading, and trading items and trading ideas. And, you know, they've had expert masons, expert farmers, people that knew the sky when it's time to plant and farm. We have equinox markers, solstice markers, lunar calendars. That's an 18 and a half year cycle. And these, I bet you most people today didn't even know that there was a pattern to the moon. And, uh, um, but uh, that's not survival. That's just doing really well, <laughs> really well. Yet they left. Was it war, drought, scarce resources, a spiritual calling? It's as easy to get lost in that question as it is to see the cliff dwellings, these beautiful homes, and to think that they are the legacy of the ancestral Puebloan people. And honestly, I overlooked it for a number of years, and I overlooked it, and I just celebrated that somebody made this with their bare hands and their hearts and sticks and stones, and it's still standing, and that's just absolutely humbling. And I thought this is their greatest achievement, and that's wrong. Well, I think their greatest accomplishment, honestly, isn't looking at what you're looking at. I think their greatest accomplishment is that they moved. That this is somebody's home, and there's moms and dads buried out here, and uh, and that's amazing just to walk away from a comfort to go to kind of an unknown and uh, and take a risk. I had to learn that lesson a hard way. My parents uh, passed, and uh, me and my brothers, we had to sell my dad's house that he built, and uh, that was tough. There's a lot of good memories there. You know, there's a comfort to what's familiar. To go to an unfamiliar is, is amazing, and an amazing risk, and an amazing sacrifice. But Today, 26 tribes claim heritage here. Their children, the Hopi, Zuni, Zia, Akama, Zia, uh, Santa Clara, San Domingo, all the various pueblos. They are the descendants of the people who, around the year 1300, extinguished the last of their home fires in these alcoves. Yeah, I'd rather be done early than lighting in the dark. They are rekindled now, just once each year. Spectacular. It, you just don't see the sight like that. Now we get to wait till the dark. This place never feels more like a home than on Luminaria's night each December. 
There's something about the night that is soft and gentle and soothing. The glow of the fire is the ancient porch light. Come in, sit, we're home. You're welcome here. It has a special magic uh, that it brings to the holiday season that nothing else can really compare with. And I believe that it's part of it is the mystique of these sites because of their ancient quality and because of the people who live there. Those people, they feel close on this night. When you look at these dwellings and you realize that people lived in these villages, that they laughed together, they cried together, they grieved together, they lived and they died, and they eked out a living. And we know they did more than that. They thrived in this home. I think it's overwhelming to most people, and it gives them, I believe, a sense of hope. A sense of hope and a sense of vision that no matter how bad things may get, that there is hope and that there is a vision for survival and even for thriving. Are we loving our national parks to death? Fair question. Spruce Tree House is closed to visitors indefinitely as of early March due to rockfall issues. Cliff Palace is scheduled to welcome visitors again in May after closures and repairs much of last year. Americans are rediscovering our national parks at a record rate. Last year, the park system set all-time attendance marks. Rocky Mountain National Park is the undisputed king of Colorado, the third most visited park in America behind Great Smoky Mountains and the Grand Canyon. Even the Tennessee Vols fans who love the Smokies can appreciate that Rocky topped 4 million for the first time last year. 4.16 million visitors. Mesa Verde is the 34th most visited park out of 58 total. 547,000 visitors last year. Great Sand Dunes National Park is ranked 43rd for visitation, 299,000 last year. Black Canyon of the Gunnison drew 209,000 last year, 46th on the national list. All of Colorado's national parks have seen significant increases in visitation in the last two years, but Rocky has gotten crowded fastest, a 39% increase in visitors in just two years. When this land returns, we go east to the San Luis Valley and North America's tallest sand dunes. I didn't even go to the tippy top. When you get here, it's unbelievable. It's like you're in a Star Wars movie. Yeah. Somebody dropped you in the middle of the desert. It's unreal. Great Sand Dunes National Park. You and nature in constant motion. I don't think there's very many employees who burn more calories than I do. Perhaps no one knows more about the dunes than that man, and he knows the perfect time to visit. And while we're talking about timing, Great Sand Dunes is open 24 hours, seven days a week. There's a special set of reasons why the dunes offer one of Colorado's best views at night. I find myself lost in a unique area in Colorado that makes me feel like I'm on a different planet. Adventures in the high desert when this land, rediscovering Colorado's national parks, continues. take us new places, but let's face it, sometimes they're confining. Step here, not there, go this way, turn that way. Let's break free. Get out in the dunes and go in different directions and, and feel like an explorer out here. Great Sand Dunes National Park near Alamosa is largely free of trails. She's just at the top strapping on and uh, she's gonna ski down. <laughs> it's a place that encourages exploration and experimentation with varied results. So we're starting to see a lot more visitors come out on the weekends in the summer 
and specifically come out after sunset. After dark, it's a whole new dunes. Great Sand Dunes National Park is most popular during the summer. It's hot, the sand is hotter, kids and grown-up kids are flying down the dunes on sand sleds and pieces of cardboard. It's a great time, but it can be crowded. Let's rediscover the dunes with a bit more breathing room. Well, the last time I was here was probably high school. No matter your age, this place makes a person feel small in the best possible way. I think it's, they're taller. I do think they're taller. Knowing the dunes rise and fall over the years explains why the hike to the top always seems harder than the last time. I remember hiking up when we were in high school and it felt like forever, but now it felt like forever just to get to the bottom of them. <laughs> this place does have a way of making us feel small and look small. That speck on top of the dune, that dark fleck on the horizon, that's a man up there. And not just any man. We'll meet him in a moment, once we get to the bottom of how far it is to the top. I didn't even go to the tippy top. But you know how tall the tippy top is? He looked behind you, look behind you. Uh -huh. Look, that's how high. How tall is that? Um, I don't even know. I have no idea. So, Hamza Molson, who's down from Denver, does know his dunes. I think those two are the tallest of them. Knows, for instance, that they're shaped by the wind. Yeah, by wind. My to dad told me. The west wind from the valley and east off the Sangre de Cristos. If you move this way, it will go that way. And if you move this way, it will go that way. And Hamza will tell you the ridge line is no place to be in a storm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it could be dangerous. But on this day, the September sun is shining, and our friend on the dunes is coming closer. Well, well, my name is Andrew Valdez. I'm a geologist here at Great Sand Dunes. Valdez is too humble to say this himself, so I'll tell you before he gets here. Without him, there might not be a Great Sand Dunes National Park. Valdez presented his research to the then Interior Secretary, Bruce Babbitt, in the 1990s. He warned that America needed to protect the dunes, make them a national park, or risk having them disappear. Valdez knew that as much as this place looks like a beach in search of an ocean, water is at the heart of the dunes. Water, like Medno Creek splashing at his feet, water is the key. You know, doing research has really made a big difference, so it's been really interesting. That research led to a first-of-its-kind Colorado water right, guaranteeing the water that holds the dunes together and recycles sand back into the valley. That water can't be siphoned out from under the park. You know, as part of managing and protecting these resources, we, we need to understand how they behave, uh, to understand how they change over time. Including how they grow. So today I was up on top of the dune with some surveying equipment measuring the height of the dunes. Finding an answer to Hamza's question about the tippy top. And on this one, the height is generally getting taller. Decades of study from that perspective. I hope I didn't ruin your experience of the dunes. Uh, leads to this perspective. Most people stop by in the middle of the day as they're traveling through the area. But if you can see the dunes when the, uh, the light angle is low, uh, then there's lots of shadows on the dunes and you see a lot of detail and it's one of the more impressive landscapes you'll ever see. In the middle of the day, everything gets washed out, but in early morning or late evening, uh, the dunes look amazing. And when winter comes and the crowds disappear, snow melt after snow melt ripples the dunes and turns former footsteps into craters. And the park allows adventures and experiments best experienced without an audience. She's been skiing her whole life and she's always wanted to ski down some sand dunes or something. So, uh, well, we figured now's the time. <laughs> Don't know if it's gonna work, but we hope it does. And we've been pretty much everywhere up through British Columbia, Alberta, all the way down through the Rockies. And uh, yeah, it's just completely unlike anything. I would never ever expect it to be out here. It's just kind of a childhood dream of hers. Without fresh wax. Speed demon. <laughs> <laughs> Downhill skiing, the dunes, turns into cross-country skiing. Snowboarding, same story. He's not getting any speed. He's not able to go. It's, uh, it's, it's sticky. It's like, you know, crazy, crazy slush. I don't think he ever went. I don't think he ever got the ride. <laughs> He's going to be so mad. What snow one day, sand the next. These guys, Eric and Jason, stopped on the way home to Oklahoma. We're at Wolf Creek, riding in a reel. Real stuff. And despite the difficulty, you gotta have the wax on there or you won't go anywhere. They'll be back yeah. to the dunes. When you're on the highway and you look up here, you can barely see it and it's not really inspiring at all. When you get here, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's like you're in a Star Wars movie. Yeah. Somebody dropped you in the middle of the desert. Yeah. It's unreal.
For the real Star Wars effect, stick around through sunset. When the sun sets, a lot of people think that this part goes to sleep. Oh no, it puts on its diamonds and it goes out for the night. Great Sand Dunes is one of the darkest national parks. I've hiked out here more at night than during the day. And the outfit would suggest Kathy Foss is an expert. The San Luis Valley is a stargazing destination because of its lack of light pollution. High elevation and dry climate give it clear, dark skies. And when winter's cold knocks the moisture and dust from the air, it's spectacular. Birds and insects rely on darkness, stars, for either navigation or for breeding. Humans need darkness and ability to look up and see dark skies to just sort of reconnect with nature. And it also brings us all together. We all have night skies. We might see things differently in different hemispheres in different times of the year, but that is one thing I feel like connects us all together. Moonrise over the great sand dunes cuts through the darkness. Under a full or a gibbous moon, the dunes are awash in light. It's something not quite day, not quite night. I find myself lost in a unique area in Colorado that makes me feel like I'm on a different planet. The moon, the night sky above the dunes, it does have a way of making a person feel small but in that best possible way. Small, but connected to everything as it constantly moves fast and slow. One of the things that Andrew Valdez, our geologist, has taught me, he has taught me to appreciate this place and all of its different movements and motions and tracking changes over time and seeing how much variation there is from year to year in such a dynamic place is really interesting. We're trying to do minimal resource damage by not taking sand with me. Yes, one last note. When you rediscover great sand dunes... Usually I'm walking across dunes, so the uphill side usually gets more sand than the downhill side. Please leave them behind, right where so many people, for so many years, have fought to keep them. Well, I've been uh, looking at this landscape, uh, driving in every morning for 20 years, and uh, I'm still amazed by it. We really love coming to the States. It's you know, such a big country compared to Britain. Colorado's largest national park draws them in droves. Rocky Mountain National Park. 43 years of coming back here. Have never been bored, have always missed it when not here. So that's all we do, we come back. People like the elk tend to herd, though you can find peace in the valley. You just have to know which one. It, it's just real private. It's, it's, uh, there's less folks than the east side. We'll explore the wild side of Rocky Mountain National Park, where you can escape the crowds with just a bit more effort. You kind of got the park to yourself, you might say. <laughs> and in this playground for photographers, professional and amateur, we have a photo challenge for you. One spectacular shot would be worth a week's trip. It really would be. Round up your best Rocky picks. Focus again. We're returning to our favorite spots for a new view. Every time we come up here, yeah. we notice something different. We find inspiration in a book that shows us how to make fresh memories in familiar places when this land returns. Some combination of the view, the altitude, and the temperature oh. takes your breath away. It's cold though. <laughs> at Rocky Mountain National Park. If Colorado has a calling card, you're looking at it. So everyone knows about the Rockies in the UK. You're always going to know about them. And then to finally get here and see them is you know, just stunning. It's so beautiful. Cold. <laughs> but it's beautiful. Rediscovering Rocky Mountain National Park takes a bit of work if only because we've become so familiar over the years. The majority of visitors to Rocky Mountain National Park pass through the East Portal near Estes Park. It's kind of a funnel for a lot of the tourists and the day visitors from the Front Range. It's not uncommon in the summer and fall to see a line of cars waiting to get in. 
Rocky even has shuttles to its most popular hiking spots. That's one way to see nature. But if you're looking to observe a species other than Homo sapiens, we have some suggestions. I just decided to come here and, and see it myself and visit. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience so far. You don't have places like this in Belgium. Jan Dierken is going to great lengths and great heights to get away. And yeah, Belgium is more very densely populated and getting, finding tranquility is not easy. And the poor guy stumbled into one of the busiest spots in one of the busiest parks at one of the busiest times of the year. I arrived here on Labor Day weekend, so it was really crowded. Didn't expect that. <laughs> The east side of Rocky Mountain National Park in the fall can feel like a drive-through nature dispensary. Drive in, snap, snap, drive out. Peace isn't impossible. I just think it's beautiful here. I can't say it enough. But it's passing. And I'd love to stay and never leave. But I would hate it if people actually stayed here. You know, let's go home, come back and visit. It's what we do. It's what so many do a record four million visitors to Rocky last year, about 13,000 on the busiest day during elk mating season. That's when antlers clash with horns. That's all right, too. They'll be embarrassed. This is the Wild West side. It really gives a nice chance to Photograph the animals one on one. Nature, it seems, rewards effort. Though, if you're talking about the drive to the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park, the effort is its own reward. Trail Ridge Road takes you over the divide into the Cowanich Valley, where the Colorado River collects its first few streams and creeks to make the long run to Mexico. And it's where you realize Rocky's beauty may peak in its valleys. just real private. It's, it's, uh, there's less folks than the east side. Alan Metter from Cripple Creek considers himself a west side kind of guy. There's plenty of elbow room. And he has company. <laughs> what are you using over there? Uh, that's a one to four, but that's the, the version two, yeah, yeah, the twist. A society of long lenses and low voices. <laughs> Even though there's a lot of folks around, it, it's just real peaceful. Back on the east side, you're likely to meet five people from five states in five minutes. A far cry from how it often works on this side of the divide. Maybe I'll come out from behind that tree, going right to left, I bet. There he is, right there. <laughs> and I've met uh, several photographers that I see, seems like every September, October. Yeah, there's a camaraderie there. It's not to say the silence and the serenity isn't sometimes interrupted. Alan is, after all, taking pristine nature photographs while standing on the shoulder of U.S. Highway 34. But Rocky's wild side is undeniably different. It was exceptional. It, it was so uh, quiet and serene for us. It was a nice morning. just the beauty of God's creation. It's gorgeous. Yeah, you can't get better than this. Coming up, how to get lost in the same place more than once. Rediscovering Colorado's national parks doesn't always require blazing new trails. But the light turned out real nice on the landscape, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I, I'm not disappointed, that's for sure. <laughs> An idea for a new adventure that's a snap. And with all this beauty, how do you choose your favorite scenes? We'll put that question to someone who's visited each park right alongside us when this land returns.
really is a beautiful, beautiful place in this country. Rediscovering Rocky Mountain National Park, Colorado's most popular park many times over, requires that we redefine picture perfect. We keep coming here because every day is different. Unlike a lot of tourists, Coloradans are in the perfect position to do it. I'm not ashamed to tell you that one of my favorite books about Colorado is mostly pictures. Colorado 1870 to 2000 weights down a lot of coffee tables around this state. It's a masterpiece. Photographer John Fielder retraces the footsteps of 1800s photographer William Henry Jackson. In each spot, he tries to put his camera at the exact same angle or as close to it as possible to capture the same place across the years to show us what's changed and what stayed the same. It's the inspiration for our final idea to rediscover our national parks. Maybe we don't need to go to new places. Just go to the same places with a twist. I'm at about 15 or 16 since I started two years ago, but I picked off 10 last week. Lucky him. I did 10 national parks in eight days. Racing around America, always someplace new. I usually shoot about 200 to 300 shots. One spectacular shot would be worth a week's trip. It really would be. Eric Gale has beat the dawn to Bear Lake. The photographer from California has come to one of the most accessible, most photographed spots in Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, it's nice too, we're getting these intermittent wispy clouds coming through the scene. There are sunsets here and lenses glint atop each rock. Every single spot around the lake was taken by photographers because it was one of those nights where the clouds were just, everybody could tell it was going to be good. Sunrise offers a trade-off, tranquility in return for some of the feeling in your fingers and toes. It seems to be crisper, a bit crisper in the mornings. It's had a chance for some of the mist from the night to take some of the sediment in the air and stuff like that. It just seems a little bit crisper. It's not quite as comfortable to shoot in the morning, but uh, I seem to come out with better light in the mornings. Yeah, so see, you just got a little bit of light coming on the, the far right peak there. There we go. With his black stocking cap crouched in the shadows for hours, Eric Gale works like a thief. Try and steal as many compositions as I can. <laughs> it's really strange. I feel like I'm walking away with something that not many other people are getting to see. Oh, yeah. That color's gorgeous. Okay, and then just make sure we got it in the bag. Beautiful. And with that, he packs up his loot and leaves. Lucky him. No, lucky us. As the seasons change, we can return to our favorite spots where so many summer sunrises and sunsets have been snapped to steal a new view. Bear Lake, blazing white in winter light, dotted and dashed with footsteps and tracks. Lucky us. And then when I rounded that turn at Estes Park, it just about took my breath away. <laughs> Who can drive an hour, two, or three and see that valley open up at the bend. They're probably used to it all the time. <laughs> I'm not. The mountains in West Virginia are what you would call hills. They're just, you know, green covered. They don't look anything like this. Yes. Lucky us, who know Moraine Park doesn't just look good in green. I've seen pictures, but it's not the same as seeing it in person. But in pink, in blue, in silver, orange, and purple. And Rocky Mountain National Park has just been our sanctuary. Absolutely. It's our sanctuary. It's where we go to find, yeah. you know, peace, quiet, tranquility. Stephen Leslie Prentice from Loveland love this land. Yeah, we call it our backyard. It's a big backyard. <laughs> Every single hike, well, that's we it. will stop, yep. look around, and say, we live here. We live here. They've worn the trail up to the lock in every season. New photos and new memories in the same exact place. Starting with one winter hike that blew them away. Oh my gosh. We uh, we actually snowshoed it. And that's when I Very said, nice time we snowshoed. that's when I put out my arms and I said, feel the freeze of the Rocky Mountain breeze. It's, it's, it's a different world altogether. It feels entirely different. In all our travels, we hear the one indispensable piece of equipment, summer, winter, spring, or fall, 
is the right attitude. In the city, snow is maybe a hassle. Here, snow is fun. I think it's a Swedish saying that's like, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. So <laughs> if you're dressed for it, if you're protected from it, you can stay out all day and feel completely comfortable and just, just have a blast out here, you know? We do. Lucky, lucky us to have planted our roots in this particular part of America, so close to this land, made for you and me. Still ahead on this land, rediscovering Colorado's national parks, there is one last person you really must meet. He's been with us all along. solitude. I think that's the thing that really is the most for me is to get out there to see things. Uh, you know, you catch those moments where you're hiking through and you, you come across a big horn sheep or a bear, or, you know, and you're just like, you know, this is his home. I'm kind of like an ant on your counter at home, you know, when you, he's there, you're you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's kind of like what you feel like out here. You're the ant and you're, you're not in your environment, you're in their environment. These are the places you just don't want to leave. Everything is so much bigger and on a grander scale in the Rockies, and that's just awesome. We're left now with a familiar feeling. There is never enough time to see everything, experience everything, rediscover everything in Colorado's national parks. But that's what return visits are for. You always walk away with a sense of pride, you know, a sense of, okay, I went through the trouble, I put in the effort, and here's my reward. It's an experience that I definitely want to do again, for sure. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah. They're very well run. So we should go back home as envoys of Colorado, I think. <laughs> I want my grandchildren to be able to do the same thing that we're getting ready to do right now. And, uh, and boy, that's where we beg the help from the visitor that comes here. Enjoy it, you know, and, but uh, make sure somebody behind you gets to see it too. I'd mentioned there's one more person you need to meet. We've met a lot of photographers traipsing from park to park and back again across the seasons. One photojournalist has captured every image we've seen, Nine News photojournalist Chris Hansen. He's crisscrossed Colorado, logging thousands of miles, spending days and nights in each park. This is largely a reflection of his experience. Speaking of reflections, that's him over there. So it seems fitting that we leave you with some of his favorite sights and sounds from this land. Thanks for joining us.